Take your Bible. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24. Just a few verses before we go into our study. Matthew chapter 24. It says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, that's Christ, the disciple came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the signs of, the, of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Verse 6 says, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Oh, yes, friends, this war, the entire world is looking at this one. We've heard of war, but this war is different. See that you be not troubled. Now, this is the counsel for us, friends. See that you be not troubled. For all these things, they must come to pass. But the end is still not yet, friends. For nation will rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. And there shall be famine, you hear that? And pestilences, disease friends, and earthquakes, not one, but many. They're already um, looking at the next pandemic, the, the, well, that is to come. And we have seen nothing yet. And there will be, we've seen more earthquake than ever before. And you know, when you read verse eight, it makes you think because it's an exciting time to be alive. He says, and all these things, they are the beginning of sorrows, which means what we encounter now, it ain't nothing yet as to what is to come. Sorrow has just begun, you know. Now, in the book Manuscript, volume five, page 305, paragraph four, Hear what the prophetess says, Ellen White. She said, in India, China, Russia, you listen to the countries and the cities of America, thousands of men and women are dying of starvation. You hear that? The mourned men, because they have the power control the market. The purchases, they, sorry, they purchase at low rate, all they can obtain, and then sell at greater increase, greater increased prices. Listen, friends, we have seen nothing yet. The prices of things will be going up. For COVID, we had about five new billionaires during COVID. Never have the world seen this happen so quickly. This means starvation to the poorer classes and will result in a civil war. There will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, friends. The prophetess wrote that. He said, and at that time shall Michael stand up, that great prince, Stand there for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Hallelujah. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Listen, friends, we are right now into the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 11. And this, what has begun, is leading to what the prophetess have described, the trials, the, the tribulation in Daniel chapter, um, Daniel 12, 2, and also Daniel 11. May God continue to be with us. As we stay focused, we continue to dig deep into his word. We search the scripture. We look for the precious gems. And at the end of it all, not just to know the Bible, but to prepare us that we could settle in truth 
our hearts will not be troubled and will be unmovable. God continue to be with us as we continue to study together. Tonight we will begin. Tonight we will begin um, with Daniel chapter seven. We're just laying out the foundation for um, the study. Uh, I think the bulk of our study would 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 be um, on Daniel eight and nine, and so we begin with seven because chapter seven introduces the 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 judgment and so tonight we are going to um begin with daniel chapter seven so just give me a minute here let me just turn on my screen let me see here Uh, just a minute, give me. Wow. I'm getting a little, getting some, some issues here. All right. Uh, okay. With me, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. Thank you for the privilege that you have given to us uh, to study a word together. We pray for your Holy Spirit to be with us as we discuss your word. We pray for your wisdom. We pray for the Holy Spirit uh, to help us to understand and to be able to apply these things to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, uh, tonight we are looking at, you know, the four beasts um, in the book of Daniel 7, and we will be looking at the introduction to the sanctuary. I'm not sure if we're gonna get there, um, but this is what we want to do this evening. Um, yes, as, as you can see, what is happening in the world today, uh, I don't think there is any, any reason for, for panic because uh, we know that we are living in, in the end of time. We live in, um, in the last days and things are going to happen. But I'm comforted by the fact that, you know, God is on his throne. He is, he is in control of this world. So it will not be any, any nuclear power that will destroy this world. Um, it will be the second coming of Jesus. Jesus is the one who will, who will be putting an end uh, to this world and not, not man, not in spite of, of, you know, what you see in happening in the world and the threat, you know, of nuclear um, clashes between the United States, um, Russia and, and um, China, you know, uh, the Bible tells me in, in in Revelation chapter seven that there are four angels, and 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 this is just a symbol, but I believe that God has angels belt around the world, holding in check uh, the 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 evil powers until um, God's servants been sealed in their foreheads, and God 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 will make sure that everyone who needs to hear. The gospel will hear before the end comes. So we just need to keep praying. 
and keep studying and, and, and be ready for whatever is to come. So tonight we will begin to establish a foundation for um, you know, what the other presentations that, that will follow this one. All right, so the four, the four visions, they're in the book of Daniel, there are four visions. All right, four visions that we find there. And, and um, so these visions were given to Daniel while he was in Babylon as a, as a, as a captive. Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, these were among, you know, the first captives that Nebuchadnezzar um, brought down to Babylon. And um, the year was in 606 BC. And these young men were taken from their homes into a foreign land. And, um, you know, they were still in their teens. Uh, they were taken as, as, as slaves. And, and I want you to know that this was no fault of their own. And as, as you know, history proved that these young men remain faithful to God, regardless of their situation, and regardless of where they were, they remain faithful to God. It was the leaders, the leadership of, of the people of God who failed them, right? So God had a purpose for, for, for these young men. They were to serve as, as God's ambassadors to the kingdom of Babylon. And it, 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 it matters not where you are, where, where you are taken, what, where, wherever you are. Just remember that, you know, we are, we are God's ambassadors and we are to um, rightly represent him wherever we are. So before, before um, Daniel received that vision in chapter 7, um, he was the one who interpreted um, the, the, the vision that, or rather the dream that Nebuchadnezzar received in Daniel chapter 2. Now, I want you to know that chapter 2, um, chapter 2 is the um, foundation. In other words, chapter 2 of Daniel lays the foundation for all the prophecies that we find in the book of Daniel. So that sets the stage uh, for everything that would follow. And so the vision of chapter seven basically is an expansion of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And so in, in, in chapter two, um, we we find we find this this image, and this image represents uh, the world kingdoms. And I don't need to go through that. But what I want you to you, you can take the time and, and and read it again. I'm sure most of you have read it, and um, just read it again so that that could help you to establish that fact that. Um, it sets the stage for every other prophecy in the book of Daniel, right? So God revealed to Daniel not only the political history of this world, but also the spiritual condition of both ancient Israel and the Christian church throughout history. And especially those who would be persecuted by the apostate church that we would discover as we um, study the rest of, of, of Daniel. So God also revealed to Daniel the ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary and a judgment in which the character of God and of those who were being persecuted would be vindicated. So Daniel 7 goes basically over um, the history where um, over the same history uh, that we find in Daniel chapter two, the four beasts are the same four empires 
that we find in chapter two with a little more information. And so every chapter that, that we go through, uh, or rather the visions, and we have, we have those four visions in Daniel chapter two, Daniel seven, Daniel eight, and Daniel 10. These are the chapters that contain uh, the four visions in the book of Daniel. So um, God expands on what he revealed to Nebuchadnezzar, to Daniel, and, and also with information about a massive religious system that Satan would set up in, 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 in the end time uh, to counteract the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary on, on, on the earth. So before we move on to the content of, of, of chapter seven, I want to establish some very important facts, very important facts and principles as it relates to Bible prophecy and the way we interpret prophecy. I think this is very crucial because a lot of the problems that um, we, will, we will come across or you know the various interpretation of prophecy uh, when we look at Daniel and Revelation, um, we would be able to avoid them if we understand these principles, right? Because there is a proper method um, to interpret the kinds of prophecy that we find in the book of Daniel and um, Revelation. So before we can interpret Bible prophecies correctly, we must understand some basic principles of interpretation. So the book of Daniel and Revelation are prophetic books exclusively, right? And um, they, 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 they are, these, these prophecies are different from other prophecies that we find in the Bible. These prophecies are apocalyptic in nature. So that's the kind of prophecies that we find in the book of Daniel and Revelation. Apocalyptic prophecies deal with end time events and the end of the world, the end of human history. Uh, these prophetic events are universal in nature. Uh, people's attitudes cannot change the course of these events. So no matter what people will do, even if they adhere to the warnings given, um, repentance will not change the course of the events that are predicted in apocalyptic prophecies. Therefore, apocalyptic prophecies are different from what we call classical prophecies. Classical prophecies are more localized and deal with specific nations or, or group of, of, of people. We find this kind of prophecies in the Old Testament. And, and these prophecies are directed against Israel as the people of God and and, and, and sometimes around uh, to the surrounding nations um, around Israel. And um, these kinds of prophecies, you know, if, when people repent, uh, the, the, the course of the events predicted can change because they are conditional. They are conditional. However, apocalyptic prophecies are not conditional and they contain symbols. And I want, I want you to note this because it is, it is crucial that we understand that, that when we are talking about um, apocalyptic prophecies, we are talking about, um, you know, uh, symbols. Uh, it uses, you know, symbolic languages and so forth. And so some of these symbols I'm going to, I'm going to share with you as we go through um, the book 
of Daniel. So um, let me share with you some of these methods uh, that we find um, that, that, that are relevant in, in terms of the interpretation of these prophecies. There are four methods of interpretation that has been used to interpret the books of Daniel and Revelation. And I want, I'm, I'm going to briefly mention them, right? And I'm sure uh, most of you, um, you know, are aware of, of, of these. Uh, and we need to have, we need to have a basic understanding uh, of these methods. Among these four methods, there is only one. And I want, I want you to note this. There is only one that is true. That is a true method. The only one that finds support in the Bible. And this is the one that we, as Seventh-day Adventists, adhere to. All right, and I'm going to continue to share that with you. Um, the Bible, as we shall discover, um, is its own interpreter. The Bible interprets itself. We don't need, you know, outside um, interpretation, man's interpretation. Um, God, through the Holy Spirit, um, gives us, you know, the keys in the Bible when it comes to prophetic um, interpretation, uh, symbols, and what the meaning of them, um, the Bible, the Bible gives us all of that in order to help us to understand what we are reading. So all the symbols that we find in apocalyptic prophecies are explained in the Bible. So the, the number one, the first method is what we call preterism. Preterism is a method that looks at prophecies, especially those of Daniel and Revelation, apocalyptic prophecies, as prophecies that have been fulfilled in the past. So basically, they put all prophecies of Daniel and Revelation uh, in the past. So, so whatever that is, that is, that is mentioned in Daniel, Revelation, um, you know, there was a there was a historical point in time where these things um, apply to, and those who support this method apply uh, the little horn of Daniel eight, Daniel seven to someone else rather than the papacy. Number two, futurism. Futurism is the method that puts all prophecies in the future, especially those of Revelation, Daniel, these, these, these prophecies they put in the future, prior to the coming of Christ, and also they, 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 they subscribe to prophecies that will, uh, some prophecies will, will, will be fulfilled even after the coming of Jesus Christ. Those who support this method believe that the nation of Israel is still the chosen people of God and that all the promises God made to them will be fulfilled in the near future. So you have, you have especially when we look at uh, Revelation chapter 7 and the, and the, the ceiling and the 144,000, the future, the, uh, the, the futuristic um, application to that is that these people are Israelites and not modern Israel, not, not the Christian church, uh, so to speak. All right, so, so that's, that's, that's the method that is used there, futurism. And then you have the third one, idealism. The idealist method claims that there is no historical purpose of the symbols we find in the books of Daniel and uh, Revelation. This method teaches that 
these prophecies are basically a symbolic description of the ongoing struggles between good and evil, which cannot be applied to any time period or any place in history. So, so these, whatever the Bible says in Daniel Revelation, you cannot place that in history or any or to any particular person, uh, historical person uh, in history. In other words, you see those prophecies, um, uh, you know, nothing in these uh, points to any particular time. This method would deny the validity of the time prophecy of the 2300 days and the specific events that took place during that time prophecy. So we cannot ascribe to this because the, all of these methods are, are not the right method that the Bible uses. Um, then we come to the, to the fourth principle, the fourth, fourth method. This method um, associates symbols with historical persons, nations, or events. It can result in a view of progressive and continuous fulfillment of prophecy covering the period from biblical times to the second coming of Jesus. So this, this method um, takes a whole sweep of history, you know, from, 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 you know, when the prophecy is given and, and, and then it looks down to the present and then to the future. All right. So um, basically that's, that's what this method um, looks at. It, it looks at the prophecies are, are being fulfilled in the past, in the present, and prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. So the first two methods uh, that we mentioned, uh, which, which, is, which is preterism and futurism, these two methods were established by uh, uh, two Jesuits, two Jesuits in an effort to counteract, to counteract the work of the reformers. Um, and so there is, there is, there is a history, there is a history behind, behind, behind these, these methods, right? So, um, with historicism, the, the Protestant Reformation uh, started as a direct result of the study of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. These reformers rediscover, in essence, the historicist method of interpretation derived from solar scripture, meaning um, the Bible and the Bible alone. So the Bible is its own interpreter. And so these, these reformers stuck to that principle in, in looking at the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. And um, the historicist method views prophecy as a progressive and continuous fulfillment over time. And so this view of biblical interpretation led men like Wycliffe, Luther, Zwingli, Knox, and other reformers to identify the fourth kingdom of Daniel chapter two, chapter eight and seven as pagan Rome and the little horn, the little horn of chapters seven and eight and the first beast of Revelation 13 as the Roman Catholic papacy. But in order to divert, divert, uh, attention from the Roman Catholic Church, these two methods uh, were put together in order to divert attention from the church uh, to somebody else or some, something else in history. So, um, you know, the aim of the church has always been to counteract the work 
works of the reformers, the works of Christ. And I want you to know that in terms of um, undoing um, the, the works that the reformers accomplished um, back then, um, the church has been very successful in doing so. Today, today, I want to declare that the only set of reformers today, the only Protestant church that we have today is the Seventh-day Adventist church. The men who, who, who were responsible for, for these methods, um, these are the two men. They, they, they were Jesuits and um, their name, Louis de Alcazar and um, Fran Francisco Ribera. These were, these were Spanish Jesuits and they were, they were also scholars, so-called so scholars. Right, so so what I want you to understand is that most most of the Christian churches of today ascribe to one of those two methods of Bible interpretation. The only Christian church that has remained faithful to and maintained the true method of prophetic interpretation is the Seventh-day Adventist church. And I, I say this, you know, with, 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 with humility, um, because if you don't have the proper and the right method to interpret these apocalyptic prophecies, you are going to end up on the wrong side of the true meaning of what God wants us to understand. So the Seventh-day Adventist church is the only church to believe in this, um, in, in this historicist um, view of interpretation. So let me, let me share with you uh, some symbolic um, um, stuff that we, we're going to come across so that, you know, you, you already know, and I'm sure that most of you already know these symbols. And for those of you who don't, uh, it's just, you know, a heads up as we continue to read um, these chapters. Beast in prophecy, we know, um, represent, you know, kingdoms. Horns represent kings, powers, and authority. Um, the sea and waters are symbols of multitudes, peoples, and languages. And, um, you know, uh, the Bible gives us, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that I did not put the various texts uh, to support this. Um, but you find in, 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 in Daniel 7, which you will discover, um, and Revelation tells us, you know, what these, these, these represent, for example, the sea water in, in Revelation 17 and verse 15, and the beasts and the horns we find in Daniel chapter 7, um, I believe verse 17 thereabout, and the winds represents the forces, um, you know, war, so strife and so forth, and so forth, right? And a day, uh, in prophecy, in, in apocalyptic prophecy, you know, does not mean a literal day, but it represents a literal year. Um, or you have 360 days. That's what a, a biblical year uh, would, would, would amount to, 360 days rather than 365. Wings represents great speed and conquest. Ribs also represents nation. All right, so in Daniel 7, God revealed to Daniel the whole future of human history from the time of Daniel up to the coming of Jesus Christ. Daniel 2 has already established the fact that 
only God knows the future. Only God knows the end from the beginning. And Isaiah echoes the same in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, where God says that he alone is God. He alone uh, can tell the end from the beginning. And my friend, I just want to encourage you that, you know, we need to put our trust, we need to put our lives into the hands of God because God is the only one who is able to keep us. Uh, he's the one, you know, who knows everything and, you know, our future is secured in the hands of God. So it is very, it is very encouraging to know that we can trust this God with our very life, with our whole future, because he is the God of the past. He is the God of the present and he is the God of the future. So let's turn our attention to um, Daniel chapter seven. Daniel chapter seven. In Daniel chapter seven, there we will, we will, we will look at, you know, these verses leading up to, to, to where we want to um, establish that important fact that there is a judgment that will begin after all the activities mentioned in Daniel 7. So read with me Daniel 7, and we're going to take it, you know, little by verse by verse and see where we get to. The Bible says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were striving upon the great sea. The question, who was Belshazzar? Belshazzar was the grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar, and his father was Nabonidus. Um, Belshazzar was a co-ruler. He was not the sole ruler of Babylon. He was a co-ruler with his father. His father made him king over the realms of Babylon while he was um, elsewhere. The, 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 the first year of King Belshazzar was probably around 555 BC. The fourth wind, the four winds mentioned, I'm just um, going, you know, sharing with you, you know, some of the, some of the symbols mentioned here. The, the four winds represent political strife and conflict. The great sea is a symbol of the sea of humanity. See again in the Bible represents people and multitude. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15. Um, in Daniel uh, 7, 3 and 4, as we move on, it says, And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. So again, these beasts came out of a, a, a multitude of people, nations, and so forth. And each of these beasts, the, uh, the prophecy says, was different, each different from the other. In, in Daniel's vision, he saw four wild beasts. These beasts are symbolic of the four world kingdoms or empires that would rule the world. Those great beasts, which are four, are uh, four kings which shall arise. That's the interpretation given to Daniel in verse 17. So these are four world kingdoms. The first one says that Daniel says that what he saw was like a lion and had eagle's wings. He says, I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Let me give you uh, some information on that. The winged lion represents the Babylonian empire. 
with its first king, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a powerful king. God gave him that power, allow him to be uh, this powerful king. And the winged lion is a fitting symbol for the Babylonian empire because it was found on many Babylonian objects of art. This first picture here, there's a picture on my screen here uh, of, of, of a lion that was found uh, on, on, on the Ishtar Ishta gate. Uh, that is the eighth gate, a main gate that, that was leading into the city of Babylon. The lion as the king of beasts and the eagle as the king of birds. Uh, a combination of these two is a fitting representation of the Babylonian empire at the heights of its power and, and its glory. Um, so with the wing and, and the lion, that represents um, the, the kingdom under Nebuchadnezzar when it was in its glory. But then Daniel says that while he was watching, he saw the, the, the eagle wings were plucked, meaning they were removed or broken off. And the lion was made to stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. This is a, a symbol of weakness a symbol of weakness. You know, um, Babylon began to decline after uh, Nebuchadnezzar and other, um, you know, Babylonian kings rule um, the, the kingdom. Some, you know, uh, allude to, to the fact that um, the plucking of the, of the, of the wings uh, apply that to the seven years when Nebuchadnezzar was driven from um, his throne. But um, when you look at the scripture, uh, you would discover that, you know, this could not be because uh, the kingdom was restored to Nebuchadnezzar after his experience. And, you know, his, his, he had greater glory and greater honor bestowed on him by God after his repentance. And so being made to stand on the feet like a man and a man's heart indicates that the lion-like qualities of, 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 of that, that, that kingdom, you know, were, were lost as a result of weaker leaders. Babylon ruled um, the world from 606 BC to 539 BC. And according to the prophecy, a second kingdom would conquer Babylon. Uh, someone whom God had named 150 years before he was born, and that is Cyrus. Uh, in Daniel chapter seven and verse five, the Bible says, and suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said, thus to it, arise, devour much flesh. This second beast, the bear, is a symbol of a second kingdom that would follow Babylon, the kingdom of Middle Persia. And let me, let me interject here that God, in his wisdom, and his foreknowledge, I mean, God, as he says, he is God. He alone is God. And he knows the end from the beginning. And so given this prophecy, and to see that this prophecy um, is fulfilled exactly as God says, gives us the confidence or greater confidence in the word of God. And so exactly the kingdoms 
as God says in the word, in his word, we have seen in history that these things just follow just as God laid them out in scripture. So we had Babylon followed by Medo-Persia. And so the, the bear is said to, 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 to raise itself on one side. So basically one side was higher than the other. This imagery is also seen in Daniel chapter eight, the ram with the two horns and one horn higher than the other, uh, but the higher one came up last. These are, you know, God is so particular, you know, in, in, you know, in, in, in giving these specifics. And, and when we look in history, we see exactly what God is saying in, in, in his word. Uh, what this means is that, you know, Cyrus, um, who, who would be the, the, the second king in the Middle Persian king empire, um, would, would be greater than the first king, who was Darius. And so, so, so that is a symbol of what we see in, in the scripture here. The three ribs in the mouth of the, of the bear represents the three nations conquered by the Middle Persian Empire. They are, uh, these nations are Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. These nations were located in the direction that the ram that we, saw, that, that we will see in chapter eight, you know, this ram was pushing westward, northward, and southward. Uh, and these are the direction of these three um, uh, nations conquered by, by Middle Persia. And so Middle Persia's rule was from 539 to 331 BC. After, after this, Daniel says in verse six, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. And so this third kingdom is a representation of the, that, that third kingdom, the kingdom of Greece under Alexander the Great. The four wings of a bird represents the speed in which uh, Alexander went on to conquer the world. And so by the age of 32, Alexander had conquered the entire world. And according to history, he, he, he died because he drank himself to death. He was only 32 years old. He had no heir to go to, to take over his, his kingdom. And so his kingdom was divided among his four generals. And the four heads on the leopard represents these four generals. These were uh, 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 Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. And when you look at the divisions of the, 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 um, the, the, the third kingdom, uh, you would discover that um, the, the area covered by these, these king, various kingdoms uh, mentioned in Daniel chapter 11, um, it's a fascinating um, um, chapter to study. It's it's very difficult, but um, you know when we when we study, we would discover that um, you know a lot is said about you know the king of the north and the king of the south, um, and these were the, the the location. This was the location where these these um, four generals occupied. Um, Cassander had Macedonia and parts of Greece. Lysimachus had Thrace and a large part of Asia Minor. Seleucus had the bulk of what has been the 
Persian Empire, part of Asia Minor, and northern uh, Syria, Mesopotamia, and the east. And Ptolemy had Egypt and the land of Palestine and parts of Syria. And so over time, these divisions were reduced to just two kings, which is referred to as you know, the king of the north. That was the Seleucid um, Empire and the Ptolemies in the south, which is Egypt. So the remnant of Alexander's kingdom lasted until it was conquered by the fourth kingdom in, uh, uh, in, in, in BC uh, 168, all right? And now uh, we coming down to the fourth kingdom, the fourth kingdom. Daniel says, after this, I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it and it had 10 horns. I was considering the horns and there was another horn a little one coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. So here we come to that fourth uh, kingdom and um, Daniel, uh, it uh, gives us a lot, a lot more information about this last beast because of the fact that the little horn on this beast is going to, um, he is going to do some marvelous things. It, it, it's, it's going to uh, really, um, you know, challenge God himself and persecute the people of God. This fourth beast is the Roman Empire. And so in the middle of all the activities of these various nations, what I want us to understand that Jesus Christ is the central focus of the prophecy. Always remember that Jesus in spite of all what we see in here, Jesus is the central focus. God is using, um, you know, this timeline through these prophecies to show his people a bigger picture of, of, of his plan. And that big picture is the plan of salvation. And that is spread all over the book of Daniel, into the book of Revelation. And so God wants us to know that in spite of, 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 of you know, what these nations, the, these struggles between the nations and, and, and fighting for world dominance, God is working out his purpose through these nations to bring about salvation to whoever would respond to the invitation. After Daniel was considering the fourth beast, the Bible says that he noticed a little horn coming up among the 10 horns with eyes like, a man, like, like the eyes of a man, which, which depicting uh, its, in, its intelligence. Uh, uh, it, it was given a mouth uh, to speak pompous words and blasphemous words against God. So let's consider the, the horns here. These, these 10 horns are on, on this beast represent the 10 divisions of the Roman Empire, something that we've seen uh, before in Daniel chapter 2, the 10 toes of the image 
that, that, uh, that um, Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. Only seven of these nations are in existence today. They are known today as the nations of Europe. The Roman Empire was divided in, 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 into 10 divisions in 476 AD. And the city of Rome was controlled by barbarian tribes between that time to 538. Uh, the divisions into which the Roman Empire was divided uh, into work, Germany, Switzerland, France, Italy, England, Portugal, Spain, and, and these are the seven remaining um, remnants of the Roman Empire, the old Roman Empire. The, the, the three horns that were uprooted um, were the, the, the Herali, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. And these, these powers were Aryan powers. And I'm gonna uh, tell you a little, a little more on that. So the little horn had some, some interesting activities as we shall see. Um, the question who, who, who or what is, the, is, is symbolized by the little horn and um, most of you know um, that it is the Roman Catholic Church system. It is the, is the, it's, it's, it's the, it's the papacy, right? The Roman Catholic system, it's a church, it's a, it's a religio-political uh, power. That's why it is mentioned in prophecy. And so the fourth beast, um, which we have already identified as the pagan Roman Empire, and it existed from 168 to 476 AD. And according to uh, what we have seen from Daniel 2, the Roman Empire after the legs of iron comes the feet of iron mixed with clay, signifying that the kingdom would not hold together. It would be divided into 10 divisions. And so in 476, the Roman Catholic Church in the Western Roman Empire saw an opportunity to fill the vacuum um, that, you know, the division had created. But it was difficult for the church to rise to power while these barbarian tribes occupied the city uh, of Rome. The first of these tribes who took control of Rome was the Herali. The next was the Vandals and the third was the Ostrogoths. These various tribes were Aryan tribes who never accepted the doctrines of the Roman Catholic papacy. Among these doctrines was the nature of Jesus Christ. And, you know, people still struggle with, with we still have debate over this, this, this nature of Christ. And so these powers basically uh, believe that Jesus Christ was, was, was a created being and, 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 and they never accepted the deity of Christ. And so they, they fought, the Roman Catholic Church fought against them. And, and that was a good thing. Um, you know, um, so, but uh, these uh, occupy the city and the Catholic Church could not, could not control until these powers, um, you know, were, were, were destroyed or, you know, taken care of. Um, the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, uh, Emperor, sorry, Justinian, help the, the, the Western um, church um, to defeat these barbaric tribes. The first was the Herali in 493. Um, the Vandals were gone in 534. And the Ostrogoths were gone 
in 538. Now, 538 is a very, um, very important date, very significant date, because this date gives us the beginning of the reign of the Roman Catholic papacy. All right, so these were um, uprooted by the Catholic Church and that began the reign of what the Bible calls the man of sin. And so it was not until all of these powers were driven out uh, that the Roman Catholic Church could occupy uh, the seat of the pagan emperors. So again, the DIT 538 is very significant especially to our Seventh-day Adventists and our theology and our understanding of the role of the Roman Catholic Church in Bible prophecy. So from verses 15 through 28, we're not going to go through these, these, these verses, um, um, you know, one by one, but what I want you to understand is that um, the whole vision of chapter 7 from verses 15 through 28 gives an explanation. The angel came back, came to Daniel and gave him an explanation of, of what these things are, what they represent. And, and I want to encourage you to read the rest of the passage, right? We're going to go through some, some of the passages just to point out some, some, some things uh, for you. Um, but, you know, what what uh, what what really troubled Daniel uh, was what he saw, um, you know, about that little horn. You know, he was he was comforted by the fact that God showed up during, you know, the little horn's power, the little horn horn's um, rule of terror, uh, according to chapter two, during the rule of the kings of the earth. Um, you know, God um, revealed that um, he would establish his kingdom reign of the ten divisions, and he would establish his kingdom forever. In verses 21, 25 to 27 um, of God's intervention, and we, 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 we're going to, to, to touch on this here, beginning with verse 21, um, where um, Daniel um, said that I was watching and the same horn, the little horn, was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in the favor of the saints of the Most High and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall in, in, intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. And verse 26 says, but the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume uh, uh, and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Um, so according to the, 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 this prophecy, the little horn, which is the Roman Catholic Church, will make war with the saints, with the people of God, and will overcome them, will prevail against them. The Roman Church would persecute the people of God for a period of time, times, and half a time. This time period, again, we are dealing with apocalyptic, um, you know, um, symbolic language here, right? And so the time period mentioned here um, is mentioned at least seven times, to be exact, seven times between the book of Revelation 
It is mentioned as time times and the dividing of time, 42 months and 1,260 days. And we know the equivalent of, of, of this period. Um, according to, to apocalyptic prophecy, time is equivalent to one. Uh, we just we mentioned that at the beginning, and times here uh, is is referred to as two years or seven hundred and twenty days, and half a time to one hundred and eighty days, which would give us a total of one thousand two hundred and sixty days, and each of these days would represent a year, a prophetic, uh, a prophetic uh, a year, complete year. One day in prophecy is equal to one year. And um, let me give you the, 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 the um, biblical uh, formula for that. We find that in Numbers chapter four, 14 and verse 34, and Ezekiel 4 and verse 6. You can read this and get the context behind that. And so the period of the 1260 um, is the period that the little horn or the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy ruled supremely uh, between 538 to 1798, right? That is exactly 1200 and 60 years. And during that time, the church persecute God's people, uh, introduce a lot of um, false doctrines into the church. And those who oppose to the church, um, those who oppose the church, they were put to death. As a matter of fact, uh, history records that over 50 million Christians lost their lives during that period known in history as the Dark Ages. So during this period, the prophecy says that this power would speak pompous words, blasphemous words, boastful words against God and, 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 and direct all his blasphemy against God. Not only would it speak boastfully um, and, blasphem and blasphemous words, but it would intend to change the law of God. The word of God is right on target, my friend. You know, if, if, if we were to carry out an investigation, you will find out that the church, the Roman church, has fulfilled the prophecy to that point. Uh, blasphemous words are the claims that the church has the power, has received or, or given divine power on earth by God, and that her popes, as it were, God on the earth. Let me point you to some claims put forth by the church, and and um, and, and 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 so before I do that, let me let me define. Um, the term blasphemy. Blasphemy is when a human being claims the prerogatives and the attributes belonging only to God. Anybody who says that they God or they 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 have the the, the power, the authority, um, you know, to 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 change divine law, you know, that's that's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. And you have the power to to forgive sin. That's blasphemy. Right? Only, only God. In the Bible, we have the example where Jesus was accused of blasphemy in, in John 10, verse 30, when Jesus said that, you know, he and the, they are one. And so the Jews uh, wanted to stone him because um, he blasphemed. And, and, and they only look at Jesus as, as a man. But Jesus, we know, was not just a man. He was he was God in, in every sense of the word. In Luke 5.20 also, when Jesus um, told this, this paralytic man 
that his sins were forgiven, you know, they, they accuse him of blasphemy. And, and that is the definition of blasphemy. So here, um, you know, we have that, you know, any human being that claim um, equality with God, and the ability to forgive sin um, is blasphemy, is blaspheming. So God, Jesus himself was God. Uh, and he's still God and he will always be God, although he is also fully man. Um, all right, so here is a quote from the outline of the Roman Catholic faith. It's a catechism book which says that the Pope is infallible. He cannot err when as a head teacher of the church, he solemnly defines a doctrine concerning faith or morals. Um, and, and, and here, uh, uh, a statement about the church. It says that authority, that's the attributes of the church, authority, infallibility, and indefectibility are the three attributes of the church. So this means that the church cannot make a mistake. The church has no defect. Uh, uh, the church has all power, all authority, uh, and, and, and only God has all authority. Uh, also, it says that the Pope is the vicar of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the vicar of Christ and not the Pope. The, the chief powers of the priests, according to the catechism, says that you know, the, 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 the chief powers of the, of the priests are to be able to offer the holy sacrifice of the mass and to forgive sin. And again, only God can forgive sin. So this is what the prophecy was pointing to, that this power would blaspheme God and, 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 and make itself equal with God, right? And the prophecy also says um, that the power would, would intend to change times and law, change the law of God. And indeed, my friend, the Roman Catholic Church has done just that, has changed the divine law of God. The Seventh-day Sabbath is one of, um, one of, uh, of the Ten Commandments um, that the church has interfered with. The church changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, and they boast about it. Uh, here is a, a, a couple quotations from the Catechism book, where it says, have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals or precepts? And the answer, has she not such power? She could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. That's the, all, the, the other um, um, churches uh, agree with the church because of the fact that they are uh, honoring the, the, the change that the Roman Catholic Church made to the law of God. Uh, she could not have substituted the observance of the Sunday, of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day of the week, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. And again, we are seeing the blasphemy that the, 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 the prophecy talked about. And so the church did not only change the Sabbath, but she removed the second commandment from the 10 that forbade the worship of idols and split the 10th commandment into two in order to come up with 10 commandments. And you can look in the catechism book, you will find their 10 commandments not matching up with the 10 commandments we find in the book of Exodus chapter 20. So he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, the prophecy says, and shall intend to change times and laws. And so while the Roman church was boasting about her power and authority, while she was making war with the saints of the Most High, Daniel saw God was about to sit in judgment over this apostate uh, power. All right, so um, let me let me let me close up here uh, to give you some time, you know, to reflect on what we have just gone over 
And if you have any question, clarification, um, we will entertain that. And so in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9, 10, 13, and 14, which I left for the, uh, for the last part, which says, I watch till thrones were put in place and the ancient of days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousand ministered to him, 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. I was watching in the night vision and behold one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. So sometime after the Roman Catholic papacy would have waged war against the people of God, a judgment, uh, according to, to these verses, would begin in heaven to judge this apostate power and to vindicate the character of God and his people. The papacy's uh, supreme rule came to an end in 1798. And sometime after 1798, the judgment were to begin. And so we can see uh, uh, in, in a very accurate way, God's word is true and that what he says would definitely happen. And we have a specific date for the judgment that is mentioned in Daniel 7, verses 9, 10, 13, and 14. And this is what we will turn to um, in our next study as we look at Daniel uh, chapter 8. So this uh, judgment that Daniel saw that were to begin uh, would begin at the end or after, sometime after the rule of the little horn power. And his rule ended in 1798. Um, we will we will we will we will we will look at um, some of some of these facts as we continue our study. So um, here is it. If you have any question or if you want to make any point, I believe that now is the time um, to do that. I think I I I kind have exhaust, um, exhaust my time. Um, yes, Brother Taylor. 